Okay, I might have found something, but it's still kind of tenuous. On the right hand side of the screen, in Mark verses 24 through 29, this is a, a quotation, Mark quoting Christ directly. And I say directly because the words that are on the right in blue are only found in the book of Mark. Now understand that when Christ was talking, he was, you know, on a circuit, traveling in a circle between Nazareth and Jerusalem, and presumably even south of Jerusalem, but the Bible doesn't talk about that. Um, and so he'd be saying the same thing multiple times to multiple crowds. So not everything he said at every time he talked is in the Gospels. So when one Gospel is saying something and the other Gospels don't talk about it, they don't talk about it because it's already been said or because it's not germane to the kind of theme that they're running, because each Gospel has its own theme. Gospel of Matthew is about the Jewish Messiahship. Gospel of Luke is sort of wrapping around the Messiahship issue and showing with an emphasis on other things for Gentiles. Mark is wrapping around both of them. <clears throat> so that's why Mark's gospel is so short. So when Mark puts in new information, that's like a heads up. You have to pay attention. That's what we got here on the right hand side of the screen. And what I'm trying to find out, is there anything in the book of Hebrews that specifically talks to Mark's gospel? Just a second. <coughs> Again, I'm allergic to fall. I apologize. Something about the pollen count. I don't know. Anyway, on the left-hand side, therefore, you have the book of Hebrews showing. And I've already explained how Hebrews is talking back to Peter's verse on desire the sincere milk of the word. Okay, that's what infants do is they drink their mother's milk. Okay, they're not mature. Okay, on the right-hand side of the screen, you have a, a quotation directly from Christ that's not in the other Gospels about maturation. Now, you have to know on the right-hand side of the screen that the whole holiday of Pentecost means to the Jews today and then, harvesting the Gentiles. <clears throat> if Mark is writing in 68 AD, that harvesting the Gentiles is of supreme importance at that point because the temple was forecast to go down 40 years after Christ's death. Okay, because that's the overlap period between the ending of the times of the Jews and the times of the Gentiles starting on Pentecost 30 AD. The temple didn't have its extra 40 years because Israel was 40 years late getting into the land. I've shown that math already in my Psalm 90 playlist. Okay, that's why you've got the 40 years, because Abraham matured 54 years early. 14 of those years were spent rebuilding the second temple. Okay, so they had 40 years left on the clock, and that's why the temple is standing for those 40 years. So everybody knew that, and they were waiting for the temple to go down in what we would call 70 AD, which it really did. But Paul was saying it might go down if it's still following the old schedule that applied pre-Israel three years into the tribulation, which would have been 73 AD. That turned out to be the end of Masada in history. So the text on the right hand side is talking about harvesting the Gentiles. Okay, it's talking about a lot of other things too. All right, one of the things it's talking to that Hebrews might be talking back to is this. This is a very scathing passage. Okay, dull of hearing is Greek word nathros, and it means a knife that has not been sharpened. It's too dull to cut. The writer of Hebrews is playing on what he had already said in Hebrews 4.12, that the word of God is a machaira, meaning a sharp two-edged sword that the Romans used in their battles. That's why they were so successful. They said it was a short sword, that they, they called it the knife, ziphos, and they were able to just in and out and disable your enemy and then move to the next person that they were fighting. They didn't have to they didn't have to spend so much time fighting. So dull of hearing means that the Makaira, the two-edged sword, uh, meaning the Bible, 
is not being absorbed by the people he's writing to. Okay, so then he's telling them that they need milk, even though they ought to be teachers, because they've been believers for so long. But they haven't been listening to the Word of God. They've been mouthing it, but not listening to it. So they need the milk. They need to go back to the beginning, okay? Because solid food is for the mature, and the people he's writing to are not mature, okay? So is he talking, therefore, to this passage in Mark? Look, take care what you listen to. Now, at first, this, this next part of it is in Matthew 7, all right? But this is a different use of the same idea. This is actually playing on Isaiah 53, 12, that Paul, will, Paul had already played on in Romans uh, 12, 1 through 3. Metron merus, in my badly pronounced Greek. Metron means measure. Merus means of measure, measure of measures. Literally, it means your standard of measure, your portion of the whole inheritance. That's used in the Greek um, LXX of Isaiah 53, 12. That's what Paul's playing on in Romans. So now here's this quote that isn't in the other Gospels. Talking about take care what you listen to. We saw this in Matthew 7 by, you know, judge not that you not be judged. For the measure that you measure will be measured back to you. But see, and more will be given you besides. This means by your standard of measure. In other words, are you measuring everything by the word? Or is, is the word coming in you? Is the measure of your thinking the measure of the word? If so, you're going to get more. See, because he's talking about listen to, not judge. Very different context. Same idea. Because Isaiah 53, 12 is on this. See, we inherit Christ because he inherits us. We're his property. Your property inherits the care of the owner. Okay, and then the purpose of the property is to be something for the owner. That's what we are. We're Christ's property. So Paul is playing on that in Romans 12, 1 through 3, when he uses metron meros, which is exactly the same kind of vocabulary that the Septuagint uses in Isaiah 53, 12. So Christ apparently, I didn't know this until I saw this in Mark. This is the first time I'm seeing this passage, because I glossed over Mark. Okay, I'm just a stupid Christian and everybody else. All right. By your standard of measure, we measured you and more besides. This is playing on that other verse of his where he says, poured out, you know, abundantly, more than you can handle. All right. <clears throat> For whoever has, more shall be given. Whoever doesn't have, that will be taken away from him. That's in the other Gospels. Okay. I mean, he's quoting that part. All right. But not in this context. This is the only place in Scripture where this these verses are juxtaposed this way all right take care of what you listen to that means what kind of teaching you get be careful what kind of teaching you get for the standard of measure in that teaching it will be measured to you in other words if you're listening to a false teacher and this plays back to peter and jude now if you're listening to a false teacher then you're going to get falsehood measured to you back into your soul, and then your soul will be full of a measure of false teaching. But if you're getting the measure from the actual Word of God, more will be given to you besides. Yeah, and if you're listening to a false teacher, you'll get more falsehood. Okay? For, to, for to, uh, whoever has, meaning has the, has the faith, has the right doctrine, to him more shall be given. Of course, you could apply that in reverse. If you're listening to falsehood, you'll get more falsehood. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away. So if you stop listening to the false teacher, the falsehood that you have remaining will go away. Because now you're getting true teaching. See how clever the wording in scripture is? See why I'm so in love with it? How can anybody not be in love with these words? This is awesome. So, that seems to be played on by the book of Hebrews. Because the book of Hebrews we've already seen is definitely plain to Peter. Okay, solid food is for the mature. And what is he now saying? He's repeating something else that's in the other Gospels, but he's juxtaposing it with this. That's new. See, he's saying he's quoting Christ here in consecutive order. So Christ really did talk like this. That's nowhere else in the other Gospels. The ideas are in the other Gospels, but not in this order. He's citing this as one complete discourse by Christ putting all these things together. We know about the mustard seed parable. 
Okay, but he's not using the mustard seed parable. Now he's doing something else. This is again on false teachers. The kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. That's not the mustard seed parable. He goes to bed at night, he doesn't know how it's going to grow. In other words, I'm making this audio now, and I'm really making it for myself. I don't know who else is supposed to get it, God knows. And God's going to plant it in somebody else who's supposed to get it. And it'll work for them, and God will make it profitable to them. I can't do that. He's making it profitable to me right now while I talk. Because this is the way I learn best. Is I have to, I hear it from him and I have to say it out loud before it, it actually gels inside my own soul. That's why I'm doing these videos, so many of them. And I don't know why it works that way for me, but it does. So go with it. So the kingdom of God is like a man who casts a seed on the soil. He goes to bed at night. He doesn't know how the seed sprouts. Now this is also talking back to Psalm 90. There's a different use of similar ideas that are in the other Gospels. So Christ must have had some kind of discussion with somebody, some crowd. Because see, the mustard seed is down here. So that's a different thing. These verses, however, are unique to Mark. And he's talking about, see, the soil produces the crops by itself, then the blade, then the head, then the mature. Now according to the way Mark is presenting this, because you have to assume he's doing it in order, the mustard seed parable came afterwards. Okay, then Mark is giving you new information directly quoting Christ that's not in the other Gospels. That's one of the markers that a new Bible book has to do. It has to give you new information directly inspired by God. That's what we saw in Jude when he talked about, you know, Michael and Satan disputing and quoting Enoch. That's new information. Might have been known off, you know, might have been known in heads, but it wasn't in the, any Bible book until it was put in there by Jew. Similarly here, text on the right isn't in another Bible book. The ideas are similar, but that text in that order with that meaning is not anywhere else. Okay, so is our boy who wrote the book of Hebrews saying this, because see, harvesting the Gentiles is what Pentecost is about, and the harvesting of the Gentiles was supposed to come once the temple went down. I mean, that was the old pre-church meaning of it. Okay? Now the church has come, Pentecost has come, the church age and the first, the last 40 years of Israel are overlapping. Okay? So both of them are true at the same time during this 40-year period. Temple goes down. Okay, so what he's trying to warn them is that they're not mature. So they're not going to be harvested when the temple goes down, which was expected to be imminent at the time the book of Hebrews was written. He's chiding them. Dull of hearing. Greek word is nathros. And the, he, he bookends this passage, starting at verse 11. This is the Greek word nathros, and then he uses it again in 6.12. Translated here sluggish, so you don't know it's the same Greek word. Okay, so the passage begins... At 5.11, bear in mind that our chapters, our ideas of the chapters of the Bible, are something we invented long after the Bible was written. This is one section going all the way down to Hebrews 6.12. Okay, so he's talking about them being too young despite being believers for so long. So is he talking back to this part? Because see, this is judgment. Puts in the sickle, harvest is come, that's judgment. Temple going down, maybe the rapture is going to happen when it does. That's what everybody was expecting. I've documented that in my Psalm 90 videos now. And also in the, the GGS 11, uh, episode 11a and following, how Paul constructs um, the meter of Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. This is really bald. Okay? By your standard of measure, Metron Maros. That's used in Ephesians 4, 16 and um, earlier in Romans 12, 1 through 3. So he's talking about the doctrine that you get makes you mature. And these people here on the left, the audience for the book of Hebrews, they, they were believers long enough to become mature, but they weren't. See, by this time you ought to be teachers, but you're not. You have to learn the elementary stuff. And this is the elementary stuff right here. Hebrews 1, 6, 1 through 2. 
okay? Now, there's another analogy here. The soil produces crops, first the blade, the head, the mature grain. Crop permits, you put in the sickle, judgment. Putting in the sickle means judgment. That's what it always means in the Bible, okay? And it's a judgment against the crop, see? Are you gonna be mature? Or when God harvests you, kills you, are you gonna still be a baby? They're saved, it's not about being saved. See, they're partaking. That's also in Hebrews 3.14. But are they mature? Answer is no. They should be. They should be teachers by now. They should be so mature. But they're not. They have to still learn the elementary stuff, which is down here. Okay, but see, judgment is coming. The temple's calling down. That's why Mark is writing his gospel the way he does. Okay, so now look. King of God, like a man who casts seed on the soil, he goes, doesn't know how it grows, he does it all by itself. Okay, he's kind of talking back to Psalm 90, which is also talking about judgment, the grass, you grow by day, and the grass is dead in the evening. Okay, man is just like the grass. All right? But implicit in this growing, is water, the water of the word. So that's what the book of Hebrews is talking about here. See? Those who have once been enlightened and they've been made partakers, see? Made partakers, they're saved. You can't be a partaker of the Holy Spirit if you're not saved. And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. Okay, powers of the age to come means that you're getting direct input by the spirit okay because that's the age to come you'll be indwelt by the spirit forever but it starts now Arabon in the Ephesians 1 13 down payment the spirit is in you as down payment okay but then you fall away you get carnal you're no longer filled with the spirit you're indwelled you're grieving and quenching the spirit it's impossible to renew them again to a change of mind in other words, you can stay carnal until you die. That's also going to come up later in 1 John 5, 16. Because they're crucifying to themselves the Son of God again and putting him to open shame. They're being legalists. They're depending on their works. But they're saved. It's the same word that's used in Hebrews 3, 14. They're saved. But they're carnal. See, then fall away. You can't renew them again. Yeah, because they've got to change their mind. We can't do it. They have to do it themselves. And they're not going to do it themselves because they're preferring their works. They're crucifying to themselves the Son of God. In other words, his crucifixion wasn't good enough. They have to crucify themselves by their works. As if his crucifixion didn't happen. Okay, now look, this is the key point of that verse, and the key point where I think it attaches to Mark on the right. For the ground that drinks in the rain that often falls on it, and brings forth what? Vegetation. See, on the right hand side, the seed sprouts and grows. In other words, you say the gospel, you put it in a video, you don't know who's going to get it, you don't know how it grows, you don't know what God's going to do with it. You don't know who's going to be benefited by it. What you do know is that God knows and God will make it good, good on it. Romans 8, 28. Okay, but that's not all that happens. It doesn't grow out of dry ground. It grows out of wet ground. That's on the left-hand side. The ground drinks in the rain. You don't cause the rain to fall. God causes the rain to fall. And as a result of the mixture of the soil and the water, there is growth. Water of the word, soil, you know, in the seed parable where the Christ talks about the seed falling on the road or falling in you, the soil is you. It falls on fertile soil, meaning you accept it, you believe it. Okay, but you also need the water of the word for it to grow. A seed that you plant in dry ground does not grow. It has to have water. Here, it's the water of the word. It brings forth vegetation. 
See, and he's quoting that to these dull of hearing people because they are not doing that. They're still stuck on elementary doctrines because they're stuck on their works, so they're crucifying Christ afresh. So now he's saying, look, ground that drinks in the rain, word of God, water of the word, brings forth vegetation useful, and they get a blessing from God. That's playing back to 1 Corinthians 3 also. But if it's false doctrine, it's going to yield thorns and thistles. In other words, the water of false doctrine. It's worthless and close to being cursed and burnt. That's also 1 Corinthians 3, wood, hay, and stubble. Okay? So now, Mark being writing, the, writing this after 1 Corinthians 3, before or after the book of Hebrews. I'm still not convinced that the book of Hebrews is elaborating on this passage in Mark, but it could be. He's talking about the harvesting of believers. See? Harvesting. Be careful who you listen to, teachers. By your standard of measure, false doctrine, true doctrine, it'll be measured to you. You listen to a false teacher, you'll get false doctrine measured to you. Because you're judging that teacher true when he's not. See? That's why it's important. This is the flip side of Matthew 7. Okay? And then, right there, harvesting the Gentiles. Now, I'm going to stop here because I'm afraid my computer is going to go wacko. But that's one passage in Mark that's only in Mark that the book of Hebrews in Hebrews 11, uh, 5, 11 through 6, 12 might be playing to. I'll come back in the next increment.